Welcome to this series of interviews with the candidates for the presidency of the European Investment Bank. So very soon, the EU's 27 finance ministers will come together to appoint a new president. Now, whoever fills this role will have some serious challenges to address in the coming years, from a war in Europe, which looks far from over, to inflationary challenges plaguing the global economy, spiraling debt, which is coming hot on the heels of a pandemic and the climate crisis. Europe and indeed the world are facing a reckoning. And as the world's largest multilateral finance institution, the European Investment Bank has a key role to play in addressing these issues. Now, in order to gain some insight into this opaque appointment process and to get to know the candidates, we invited all the candidates to join us for a conversation about their vision for the future of the bank. And we're absolutely delighted to have Thomas Ostros, current Vice President of the European Investment Bank, join us for the conversation. Thomas, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much, Michaela, for inviting me. Uh, thank you for having me. So, Thomas, um, let's start with uh, the most obvious question. If you could tell us a little bit about your career and your background, uh, and how your experiences, uh, in your view, would contribute to your success as uh, EIB president. I'm happy to, to give you a few words on that. I, I'm an economist uh, by, by training and by, by trade. I uh, have served in the Swedish, uh, the Swedish government for more than a decade in different uh, ministerial posts. I was uh, uh, deputy minister of finance and minister for fiscal affairs. I was Minister for Education and Science and uh, Minister for uh, Trade and um, uh, Industry. Uh, so that was an interesting uh, period in my life where I worked with uh, uh, dealing with the consequences of the financial disaster that we went through in the early 90s in Sweden and uh, bringing the country back to safe grounds again and economic growth again. Since then, I've uh, also been uh, head of the Swedish Bankers Association. Uh, Swedish banks are all active in the Nordic Baltic region. That learned me a lot about the financial interconnections uh, in a region like that in Northern Europe uh, and the funding situation for banks and how regulation can affect banks. I was recruited then to the International Monetary Fund uh, as an executive director representing the Nordic Baltic countries in the board of the IMF. So the international uh, financial architecture has since then been uh, a topic that has really governed my professional life. That was a, a very interesting period, five years in Washington, uh, dealing with uh, everything from uh, the Greek crisis to uh, uh, Argentina and to uh, the new trends in uh, international financial markets under the leadership at that time uh, of Christine Lagarde and then uh, recruiting also Kristalina Georgieva. Uh, I was then recruited to become vice president uh, of the European Investment Bank. And there I've had a very interesting portfolio of responsibilities. I'm responsible for our energy lending and our energy lending policies. And uh, as you might understand, that has been a big focus for us in recent years, not least uh, after the brutal Russian invasion of Ukraine and the energy crisis that it has caused. We are stepping up our financing of energy, energy efficiency, energy connections very strongly. I've also had the responsibility of health and life science lending related activities. Also that during the pandemic and the financing of uh, BioNTech, uh, uh, where we provided the financing for the vaccine that they were able to create, has been a seminal uh, development for the bank and we are now a health-oriented bank uh, that can compete with uh, any other multilateral institution in that field. The third responsibility I've had in the bank is uh, also very interesting. I've, I've had the responsibility to introduce a supervisory function of the bank to see to that we really adhere to the best banking practices and standards. Uh, and I, th I, I, I think we are now the front runner of the international development banks. Uh, when it comes to being both supervised and fulfilling uh, very high requirements. And this is very important uh, going forward. 
That's fantastic. But let's imagine you're successful in your candidacy uh, and you're appointed president of the uh, EIB. So what, what would the bank look like at the end of your first term um, in 2030? So in other words, what, what's your vision and what are your aspirations for the bank going forward? So in my view, the bank as a climate bank is a very, very strong uh, topic. Uh, I think it was very timely announced. Uh, it has been uh, uh, under implementation since a couple of years. Uh, uh, there's no doubt that we are the front runner in that field today. And this is the direction that must continue. The completion of uh, the European Investment Bank as the world leading climate bank is, I think, uh, of utmost importance. What we need to do is also to become even stronger when it comes to impact impact on um, uh, growing high-tech companies, impact when it comes to innovation and science, uh, fields where we need to take a bit more risk on our balance sheet to be even more impactful. And this I would push for, and this goes hand in hand with uh, being supervised and having best banking practices. It is when we have strong risk controls in the bank and have an excellent risk management system in place when then we also can take on more risk. And I've seen in, uh, in recent years in the bank many examples of what we can do. Let me just give you one. We finance, for instance, uh, uh, now Europe's biggest venture debt portfolio in life, life science companies. That is that we can go in and finance small and medium-sized, fast-growing life science companies with lending that is very close to equity. So we call it quasi-equity. That helps them to fulfill their ambitions and grow as companies and then being able to find themselves on the equity market. And these type of operations, I think we should continue to do and do in a larger extent all over European Union. Uh, but it's also about EIB Global. That has been one of my responsibilities together with my French colleague, Vice President Fayol, to create EIB Global, uh, uh, our lending arm outside the European Union. Uh, that has been uh, in place now for a year and a half. We've been doing uh, financing in Africa, since, for instance, since 1965. So that is not new in itself. But we, uh, with EIB Global, we have raised our profile. We are developing now our portfolio and how, what type of instruments that we can offer. We are strengthening our partnership with global actors, not least the United Nations, uh, United Nations institutions. And we are strengthening the presence on the ground. The other day I came back from Nairobi, where we're now building up our regional East Africa office, employing uh, European and local ex experts to see to that we are closer to our clients. Uh, that's great. Thank you. I mean, uh, so you've spoken about your aspiration for the EIB to become, you know, to continue to be the front runner in the world as, you know, the world's leading climate bank. What do you think needs fixing now for it to do so? Yes, there's so much to do, of course, to see to that we improve. One of our, our uh, weak points is that we tend to be a bit of a bureaucratic type of bank. Uh, there, there are strong historic reasons for that. But I think we can be much more agile. We can come closer to uh, conclude our deals and we can come faster into a situation where we actually disperse our lending by going through uh, the processes that we have, be a little bit more pragmatic and a little bit less uh, bureaucratic. I think this is a work that has started, but it must be implemented uh, with force. Uh, we need also to come closer to our clients uh, to see to exactly how can we develop all the tools that we have in our toolbox to see to that we actually can provide what they need. For instance, I talked about small and medium-sized companies and how important it is to finance them. But it's also an issue of high-tech, medium-sized, uh, bigger companies that in Europe can uh, do not have access to the same type of financing like their U.S. competitors. And here, I think we should take a step to see to also to finance those type of companies, clean tech companies, for instance, uh, 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 that can be uh, the champions of tomorrow. Uh, we have taken initiatives, but we need to do more in that respect. So let's talk a little bit more about climate. Um, 
So in 2020, as you're very aware, the EIB published a roadmap for 2021 to 2025, uh, a commitment to increase its support for climate action and environmental sustainability uh, with a target of more than 50% of its lending activities, and also to fully align its finance, financing activities with the Paris Agreement. So what's next? Um, can the bank be even more ambitious uh, in supporting climate action? Yes, we can, and I think uh, we must. Uh, we, can, we can reach the targets uh, quicker than expected uh, if we uh, put uh, our real minds into it. And uh, we can be better also in supporting innovation in this field. Because this is a field in high need of innovation. If we are going to get down the green premium, the extra cost that still is on the market for some of the sustainable choices, we need to get it down so that it can really compete out those more, more dangerous choices that people and companies do today. Then we need innovation. Uh, I think the energy field is extremely interesting in that field. Here we have seen cost for renewable energy coming down dramatically the last 10 years. Uh, we should be part of that type of development by being able to support high-risk new type of projects, innovative projects in renewable energy, in grid solutions, but also in energy efficiency, which is often mentioned to be the, high, the lowest hanging fruit. But in fact, we need to do much more in energy efficiency by using innovations to use less energy in the future. So this is a great field for uh, new thinking and a uh, new type of work from uh, the European Investment Bank. So talking about renewables, um, uh, again, as you know, several African leaders have consistently stated that renewables alone cannot develop the continent. And President Hoyer has maintained that the EIB will not reverse its ban on fossil fuel lending. Do you subscribe to this view? We actually had the conversation with our shareholders on, under my leadership uh, just a short time ago when we made the sort of a uh, revision of the energy lending policy and discussed should we choose another track. And there was a very strong support from the 27 member states saying that no, stay on course. It was a radical step to take almost three years ago, when we said we are stop, we're going to stop financing carbon-based energy production. At that time, it was highly controversial. Today, our member states, say, member states say, no, continue, because you are actually having great impact, both inside and outside EU. And regarding outside EU, just the other day, I came back from the Africa Climate Summit in Nairobi, led by uh, Pre Kenyan President Ruto. And I had a bilateral with him, a very good one, where we discussed exactly these issues. We have been active in Kenya for a long time, investing in renewable energy, geothermal energy, but also wind power. And Kenya is today, today supplied by more than 90% by renewable energy. That has kept them uh, uh, safe during this energy crisis, safer than many other African countries. They are aiming for 100%. And we agreed that we are ready to look into further expansion of geothermal financed by EIB. But we also agreed, together with uh, the Commission President uh, uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, and the German representatives from the German government, uh, on the inauguration of the summit, we, we signed a cooperation agreement to foster uh, green hydrogen in Kenya. They have abundance of renewable. They could be a hub for green hydrogen. They can use it for local fertilizer production or for exports as they, cho they choose. The third thing that we agreed upon was how to use renewable energy in establishing electric bus transportation in the congested city of Nairobi, where we are ready to finance a, a big effort to, to buy electric buses, to have specified lanes for the electric buses, and that would re revolutionize collective transport systems in uh, Nairobi. So I think these three examples of what we do in Nairobi could also be used uh, in many African countries in partnership with us. Excellent. Uh, we'll come to EIB Global in a moment, but before then, let's talk a little bit about Ukraine. 
Um, so in uh, last year, following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, the EIB dispersed close to 2 billion uh, euros in immediate assistance to the country. Uh, and then this year, the EIB's Board of Governors approved the creation of an EU for Ukraine fund, uh, for which member states have only contributed around 400 million euros uh, to support Ukraine's most urgent needs. And this is a drop in the ocean in terms of what will actually be needed. But under your presidency, what role do you envisage the EIB playing in both the short-term assistance and long-term reconstruction uh, of Ukraine? Yes, this will be a major task for the bank uh, for a very long time. Remember that Ukraine is also a candidate country to the European Union. So one day, hopefully, they will also sit in our board as shareholders of the EIB. I mean, I was proud of the bank and our owners when we just uh, two weeks after the brutal invasion by Russia, had a board meeting and decided to disperse all, almost 700 million euros immediately to uh, the Ukrainian government for their, at that time, of course, desperate needs of financing to uh, pay for the essentials. And since then, we've been very, very active in Ukraine uh, during wartime. But remember, we have been active in Ukraine for a long time, since independence, so we know the country very well. So this will be a major task, and I see several important uh, missions for us to fulfill. We, are, we have now, uh, the office is working again in Kiev. We have uh, uh, people on the ground. We have an extensive program now with technical assistance to prepare for those things that are most uh, pressuring to finance in form of infrastructure and other needs. Uh, I think we will do a lot of infrastructure, of course, a lot of energy and heating system, electricity grids, that have been destroyed, but we're also going to do uh, supporting private investments and private businesses. And we are preparing now for the next step uh, in that uh, phase. Uh, yes, the member states agreed that we could uh, uh, establish a trust fund. Uh, and that will complement, of course, what we traditionally do. We, traditionally, we work on the European budget guarantees, and that makes it possible for us to take on substantial risks, even a country, war-torn country like Ukraine. So uh, budget guarantees must be uh, one of the centerpieces in the building blocks of the future, and it will be, I'm convinced about that. But uh, the trust fund can help us to complement and to see to that we can keep up speed. I think we will reach uh, substantially higher than the 400 million that you refer to now. We are in a, a close dialogue with member states, but also with uh, countries that are closely affiliated to the European Union. So I think we will reach a, a, a substantial target there. And uh, long term, of course, it's about uh, the European uh, priorities in the budget to see to that we stand very closely uh, together with Ukraine to rebuild the country. Sometimes you get sort of a feeling that people say it's a, such a daunting mission to build up a war-torn country, so we must wait and see. I have the exact opposite view. We need to be there now, because if this country is going to survive, they need the daily support of the global community to see to that their economy works, that their revenue works, that people have salaries and can sustain their lives. And there we need constant repair of infrastructure. We need constant support of private and public efforts to see to that the country can go on fighting for their existence. And Thomas, how, how is the bank working with the EBRD in Ukraine, the EBRD being, uh, you know, perhaps the biggest player um, in Ukraine? Is there a, a division of labor that you have uh, or how are you supporting each other? We have a very close uh, cooperation with the EBRD. I myself, since we are shareholders of the EBRD, I'm the governor uh, representing EIB at the EBRD's uh, board of governors. And uh, I have very close cooperation with their vice presidents to see to that we coordinate well. Uh, we do that in Ukraine, but we you do that also in Western Balkans and uh, in Central Asia. So I think uh, this is, of course, very important. EIB is the European Union Bank. Uh, EBRD is a more global actor, but we uh, like to cooperate with each other and we should do that uh, very strongly also going forward. So that uh, and the sort of the division of labor comes quite naturally. We have different profiles, we support each other, uh, we can take the lead on different projects and we can co-finance on others. 
And we have under uh, my uh, supervision also now uh, an agreement on how to share the work that we do to facilitate cooperation. So I think uh, I look forward to deep cooperation with the uh, EBRD going forward. Great, thank you. Uh, let's talk about EIB Global now. So uh, last year, the EIB launched EIB Global, which is the, the bank's dedicated branch for investments outside of the EU. Now, at the latest EIB forum uh, this year, um, President Hoyer argued that EIB Global sh should seek to gain the, and here I quote, the firepower to provide the EU with the necessary financial clout to pursue its strategic objectives in the world. Do you share this view? I think uh, it has been clear for many member states, not least since we created EIB Global, what an important tool they have in their hands to support European Union goals outside the European Union. Uh, I think uh, also the concept of Team Europe, where we uh, cooperate closely with the national actors, each and every development finance institution from the member states, has gained in importance in, in recent years. But to have a bank that follows European Union policy goals, follow European Union standards, and follow European Union policy direction, is, of course, of crucial importance. And I think we see that in Ukraine, of course, but we see that not least in Africa, how important it is that Europe is present and combine its firepower with national and uh, uh, supranational institutions so that we can uh, be good partners with African countries. Um, uh, we have now, for the first time, which I think is a very important step, dedicated capital contribution to EIB Global from our shareholders. And that has been important for us because that makes us a more, even more efficient actor. We have, of course, commission guarantees as the basis for our lending. But to have our own capital also to complement, uh, to create more impactful operations, to be able to be a good partner to other multilateral institutions like the World Bank, that is an important step, and I think it has benefited EIB Global and Europe very well. And do you think EIB Global should become its own sort of fully fledged subsidiary? I would say that I don't think the sort of the organization per se is the most important thing. But what we should think about going forward is how do we cooperate best with the Commission and with member states. And then it might be argued that having a board with shareholders where the Commission and different member states were shareholders could increase that. But I think we're showing now by the month of work to do or the weekly, weekly work we do that this organization as a branch also work well and efficiently well. So we're seeing some of the other multilateral development banks, like the World Bank, obviously, rethink their current roles, their mandates, their financing, uh, something you talked about, their risk approaches as well. Overall, how is the EIB engaging in this MDB reform agenda? And do you think the EIB needs to revisit its own role and mandate? Yes, we've been very engaged. And it, in fact, uh, the, the agenda was created during the period where President Hoyer was chairing the MDB group of the 10 biggest MDBs in the world. So we've been um, uh, very much in the loop on this. And for us, it is a, it, a discussion that is just going on right now in our board. So what we are looking at is, first of all, I must say that EIB Global is a very good response to the call from G20 on improving uh, development banking. I think uh, what we do, for instance, when we uh, now uh, look at how to uh, have a broader palette of uh, tools to offer in partnership with uh, uh, development finance uh, uh, countries, is uh, exactly in that direction. We are now looking at extending maturities to get more concessionality for countries that are particularly vulnerable. We are now looking at establishing climate disaster clauses in our contracts, contracts for vulnerable countries. So if they are hit by a climate disaster, uh, we can uh, see to that the, the loan, loan conditions are uh, adapted to that. So we are very much doing uh, these type of changes already now. 
But in the board, we are discussing also other important uh, topics. Uh, we have we are now the host for the GEMS, the database for low income and medium income countries when it comes to lending, that the G20 pointed out as a possible uh, uh, standalone entity that can be even more efficient in spreading that information. And being hosts for this, we have taken the lead and think that this can actually be done and we would be ready to have it uh, in the EIB, uh, finance together a group of MDBs to see to that this becomes a very good database also for others to take part of. Uh, we are also looking at the gearing ratio debate that was pointed out from the G20. So yes, the answer is yes, we are very much involved in this development. Uh, I think we also can we provide some learning to other multilateral development banks. Our work uh, for decades with the Commission, where we leverage Commission budget by using that as guarantees for our lending, is second to none, I think. And uh, we have, uh, by using uh, advanced financial instruments, really developed that way of uh, uh, efficiently use the scarce public money that there is to expand it into leverage lending uh, in a way that I think others can learn from also. Great, thank you. Um, and then just one final uh, area that I'd like to cover, which is really about um, gender. Mm. So the latest EIB group strategy on gender um, goes back to 2017. Um, but the bank is also leading the She Invest initiative to mobilize around 2 billion euros of gender responsive investments in Africa, Asia and Latin America. But do you think the EIB should pay more attention to gender, both in terms of its external investments and also its own internal policies and administration? I mean, what more could it do? I think it's core. I think it's core both when it comes to how impactful our investments are both inside and outside the European Union. There's more and more research that shows that gender equality uh, is not only about uh, a self-evident issue of human rights, which is the starting point, but it's also about smart economics. If we want to have economic development, gender equality, I think, is crucial. Uh, you mentioned She Invest, which is an initiative from our side uh, when it comes to our lending outside the EU. And uh, in my view, it has been successful. I mean, we are now raising our ambitions in She Invest to see to that we invest in uh, gender related investments that has positive outcomes for women and girls in our partner countries. And uh, to have these type of initiatives is very important because it trickles down through the organization. And in the end, loan officers are actually looking for how to improve gender impact when they are discussing possible investments. I mean, metro investments in, uh, in India uh, has been improved by having dedicated female carriages to see to that uh, women can travel safely. And this comes as a, a, a result of a conversation between lenders and promoters when uh, we have this goal to look for how to improve and how to uh, uh, excel in this area. But this is also, as you say, something to think about inside the bank. There's no organization that will be successful if it doesn't take both genders into account when it comes to developing the institution. And we must be better to see to that we utilize all talent and all expertise in our bank. And if we do that, gender equality should be the outcome. Uh, otherwise, there's something strange going on. So I think we can do a lot when it comes to gender issues. I come from Sweden. I have that uh, conversation with me uh, for many years uh, uh, in government and in private sector that this is uh, the best way of going forward if you want to develop an organization. Agreed. If I can just ask you one final question. Uh, this is about really how you build consensus with 27 member states, uh, sort of board of, of, uh, of governors. Do you foresee any challenges in getting member states to align with your, your vision? Yeah, let me be very clear. There will always be challenges because of course, I mean, we are a member of 20, we are an organization of 27 shareholders with a little different perspectives. But I have, from my experience, uh, being a, a minister and a member of different councils in the, the European Union, Competitiveness Council, uh, Research Council, uh, and many other councils during my career, 
uh, being a, 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 an actor in this shaping con consensus, both being able to be clear on what you want to do, but also understanding that you need to forge a consensus if the organization is going to go forward. And also in my role now as vice president, for instance, in the energy lending, where there might be different views from different member states, but we've been able to continue a very progressive agenda on energy and having consensus in the end after numerous conversations. I enjoy both of these roles, being clear of what I think is the right direction, but also trying to forge and stimulate a way of coming forward by getting the support broadly in the European Union. And that is uh, the strength of the European Union. We are clear on that we all often have different starting points, but we have now a very strong track record and also getting a joint view in place and then implement it. Excellent. Thomas, is there anything else you'd like to share about your candidacy, about the direction you think the bank must take in the coming term? Well, what we have in the European Investment Bank is a group of fantastic staff uh, or services, as we call them, in the European Investment Bank. I've always thought that working with these type of people in an organization is the best thing that you can do in your working life. And now I feel I'm, I've come home now to the European Investment Bank because the excellence that you meet among staff is fantastic. But it's not only that. The engagement, both inside and outside the European Union, in what you do. And I think uh, the concept of the climate bank has made us also very attractive for young people. Because people today, they want to do something that has a value added, that has a purpose. And this bank has a purpose and we are needed. And uh, we must see to that we can recruit all these young people with different talents that are uh, colored by wanting to do something good for the development of Europe and uh, the world. So that is something that has also made me very enthusiastic about the European Investment Bank. Great. Thomas, thank you very much for joining me uh, for this conversation and for sharing your vision, your thoughts for the future of the EIB. Uh, it's been really fascinating. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much for having me.